I will say that I was in Germany this last week talking to the 1st Infantry Division as part of a team uh, hired out by the Defense Department that briefs troops before they go into Iraq and or Afghanistan. And we give them a series of culture, uh, information operations, media, uh, security assessment, language, just basic get to know where you're going brief, um, not your actual war fighting type training. We don't teach them how to throw grenades. They would teach us how to throw grenades. But we give them this kind of stuff. It lasts for about a week. And a number of issues came up when we were speaking to the 1st Infantry Division. One is they're putting, being put on strategic reserve, so they're not actually sure where they're going to go. But obviously, uh, it looks like they'll probably end up down in the Middle East rather than in Central Asia rather than in Afghanistan. But um, I don't remember if uh, or know if anybody recalls seeing in the USA Today last week there were a bunch of uh, statistics for the war in Iraq. Do you ever, anybody recall that? Like they had a, said like IEDs or suicide uh, IED attacks were like 4,000 in 2004, for almost 5,000. They were up to 10,000 in 2005. It was a pretty sobering statistic as to the escalation of the insurgency, the conflict there in Iraq. And what we've been trying to do is determine what's going on in Afghanistan because recently there's been a number of attacks. There was a high-profile uh, vehicle-borne IED that hit a Canadian diplomat and his team, I think, two weeks ago. And um, so there's been a number of these attacks. And so I went to Afghanistan for the month of November to get a look and see what was going on. And that's kind of where I'm going to see for myself what was happening. Um, I have to put these reading glasses on from now on, especially if I don't have my PowerPoints. It's really embarrassing, but that's just the way it is. Uh, when I arrived in Kabul, I, I first flew into Bagram. <clears throat> it's early November. And then we spent some time there. I met with some of the people, uh, some of the different commanders there, got their assessment of different things. And then we took a helicopter from Kabul to Bagram. The, as the helicopter was landing, if you've been to Kabul, Afghanistan, uh, the airport is in a position here, and you go to the U.S. Embassy, peel off this way, and then you go out that way, and it's Jalalabad Road. You pull out to the left, and it's down the Jalalabad Road. There were two vehicle-borne IED attacks on the Jalalabad Road that morning as we were flying in, both against German uh, peacekeepers, German I, uh, members of the ISAF troop contingent there. Basically, a car bumped. I mean, there's different press reports, but what they can sort out, car bumped them as they got out to you know, take care of the wreck. That's when the guy detonated the bomb, killed, I think, I know one German, and I think injured four or five. There was another one, a guy on a bicycle, ran his bicycle into a car, and uh, I think just really blew himself up, and I think a couple of civilians, I can't remember the details. So when we got to the airport, it was kind of tense, because our little convoy is waiting to take us to the embassy compound. But it was tense because it's happening just down the road. So it was a, kind of an interesting start to a month dedicated to finding out if it's kind of heating up or what's really going on in Afghanistan. Um, we got in that day, went up into the defense attache's office, and everyone's scurrying around. And I said, what's up? And they said four members of the NSA and their vehicle were just, vehicle born, were just hit by an IED in Kandahar. We just heard it over, you know, over the waves. And I said, you know, is everybody okay? It appears they're okay. It was a hardened SUV, Toyota 4Runner, but it's pretty armor-proof. It uh, ripped the vehicle up, but they walked out of it. I never saw that come up in the press, and at the time they were spinning the story so it would be an NGO, because you're not going to report on your security agencies uh, injured, killed, and, killed and wounded. Um, so that was a very busy day. That night, as I went, we bunked down in our Connex trailers. Uh, I just got to sleep, and a rocket hit about 100 yards away. And it, sat, it shook, our, shook our little Connex trailer and, put, and made the, alarm, the alarms went off at the embassy compound. And I thought, you know, this is a pretty busy day. Two IEDs on the Jalalabad Road, one in Kandahar, and a rocket attack on the embassy all in one day. And so my first impressions were it is, in fact, heating up. Um, but you have to look a little more than that. Um, I have some interesting graphs that I'm going to show you in a minute, I'm sure. Uh, but... I think I'll have. To, I think I'm just going to. Basically, you can see an escalation. I wanted to show you some of the the the, uh, the patterns of attacks, and more alarming, perhaps, is the notion or these uh, suicide attacks, which have really escalated in the last few months. And um, so it looks as if there are is a peak. But one thing I've been very cautious to say is that one, don't trust any numbers out of Afghanistan or Iraq. If people, it'll give you a good general idea, but to say there are 10,423 attacks, 
Yeah, maybe there is, maybe there isn't. Generally, you're right, but don't ever, I mean, it's hard to report in war zones, and the more difficult it gets to report, the less accurate your numbers are going to be. In Kandahar, a film crew from uh, Ch British Channel 4, I worked with them a lot, so I was out visiting them this last trip as well. They had to pull their crew out of Kandahar after one day. It was just simply too dangerous to operate. So anything you get out of Kandahar is going to come from local Afghani media. Maybe an NGO caught it. Maybe the U.S. military is going to report it. But the U.S. military is not running around Kandahar. They have a huge base outside of Kandahar. The Canadians have a PRT, Provisional Reconstruction Team, right in Kandahar, and they're the ones that took the hit with the diplomat last, uh, last I think it's been two weeks now. And so the numbers, they give you a general picture, but they you shouldn't be treated as exact truth. Um, also, uh, the other thing I always see, and I read in the paper, is that when I was in Mosul and, um, a couple, in spring of 2004, it was really quiet. And coalition commanders were saying, this shows we're beating the insurgency. You have to let the, you have to let the, time, you have to let the story play itself out. I mean, things aren't going to be decided in a month. If there's no activity in a month, it could mean a multitude of things. It could mean they're preparing for larger attacks. It could mean that the coalition is clamping down. It could be that it could be anything. It could be weather. So you have to look at a more longer view of it to see if the overall picture looks like it's, it's, it's security is increasing or decreasing. And if we can get the graphs up, we'll do that. Um, but the real question is, uh, why is it heating up? I mean, right now, in the last three months, I would say absolutely it's heating up. If you look at the graphs, which hopefully will pull up, it is spiking. Suicide bombing, which was really not even an issue in Afghanistan, is, uh, well, that's not my slide, is definitely on the rise. Um, and this is what I gathered from what, I mean, from what I could tell. First off, there's increased pressure on the PAC border areas by U.S. troops. A lot of the forward operating bases have pushed even further up into the areas right on the border. And so if that was a safe haven to Afghan or anti-coalition, I say anti-coalition forces because one, again, it, it goes along with this accounting. You know, there's Al-Qaeda, Taliban, and there's probably others. I'm never comfortable saying he's Al-Qaeda or he's a Taliban. I don't know what they are. They're certainly anti-coalition, and maybe they're one and the same, and maybe there's different groups. But for my, the purpose of my election, I'm going to say anti-coalition forces. They don't want the U.S. there. They don't want the Brits there, the Canadians. They don't want anybody there. But, so whoever they are, um, and of course they include uh, Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Because we've pushed the forward operating bases closer to the border areas, we're making direct contact frequently because, ah, here we go. Here we go. I'm going to back up and just show you a couple slides real quick. Thank you, guys. And that's my fault. I arrived too late to get it figured out. Okay, what is this? Okay. I'm <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry. No, that's okay. Forward, backward. I know that's what they're going to Oh, okay. Right and you have a mouse if you want one. Okay, so that's... All right. This is me. This is arriving at Bagram, getting ready to take our helicopter ride. Um, some of them are just images. That's the German ISAF vehicle the car bumped into on November 14th. Again, the car bumped into it to set the vehicle up, <clears throat> get it to slow down. I'll just mention that not too long ago there was a video on the new, in the news, and this is Iraq. And some of the, I'm going to say, say, say things about Iraq because it's the same strategy or same tactics being used on both sides. But uh, the idea is when you're on places like the Jalalabad Road, you don't slow down. You don't stop. And, and it kind of goes contrary to some of the uh, Hearts and Minds campaigns because... If you stop, it's well known that you become more of a sitting target, right? So you always keep moving, which means you go into the other lane of traffic, go into oncoming traffic, you go on the medium, you drive on the sidewalk. And every time we went down the Jalalabad Road, we drove the exact same way. We never stopped. We used all four lanes, two this way, two that way, the medium down the middle, and the sidewalk. It's a lot of traffic jams. We don't want to get stuck on roads that have had repeated IEDs because chances are, you you know, it's hard for a guy in a remote trigger to hit you when you're going over 20, 30 miles an hour. He's got to be really good. But if you're going five miles an hour, it's not hard. And so that's the strategy. Um, anyway, U.S. and coalition combat deaths during Operation Iraq, uh, Enduring Freedom. You can see way back in, you know, from the very beginning that we had some spikes here leveled out. And then recently, I guess I could use the pointer, huh? We've seen some, some, uh, some bigger spikes. But overall, it's, it's kind of held steady. There's been some definite lulls here. And we're going to talk about, I'm going to give you some suggestions as to why that might be. Um, 
major tax. Okay, this is just in the last six months, six or seven months, week by week, basically. It's, I mean, it peaks, you know. At times there's nothing, three-week period, nothing. It doesn't mean there were no attacks in Afghanistan. It just means that they were not reported. If the, what if the IED guy missed? You know, they're not going to, I mean, again, that's why I say you can't use hard numbers, but this is, you can derive some patterns and see if any, you can see if there is a pattern. Um, what you do see no, more noticeably is that you had one suicide attack in the early days of the conflict, and you had none until you had one kind of midway through, and then you've got all these suicide attacks here. Now, Al-Qaeda has said that they've trained over 200 suicide bombers. They're implanted in the local population, and uh, they're just waiting to wreak havoc on U.S. coalition forces or, you know, or collaborative uh, Afghan forces. That, it's hard to say. We'll, we'll see. We'll look at this graph six months from now and see if this is a, a, a tactic adopted uh, strongly uh, in more force. Again, if you break out suicide attacks alone, there's definitely been an increase in suicide attacks toward the end. I mean, an increase basically from zero. It wasn't a tactic. It wasn't a, it wasn't a part of the insurgent doctrine to use suicide attacks. Which has led a lot of people to suspect, okay, is it Afghan? Are they outsiders, you know, coming in to fight? What was striking about the um, NSA vehicle attack, which didn't get reported, was that the word around the embassy was, amongst the defense attache's office, was that the mayor of Kandahar had admitted that it was an Afghan who initiated that attack, which they felt was more troubling, the fact that an Afghan actually carried out the attack. Again, what does it tell us? It's probably too early to say that, oh, all the Afghan has been, Afghans have been, you know, there's been a strong segment militarized by, by al-Qaeda or, you know, Wahhabism or whatever, but it's hard to say. Um, but it does possibly point to something. Uh, and the casualty and death rate. Well, obviously a lot more wounded. Again, it's just another way of looking at the, the data. This one was fairly successful way back when. And I think this one here, that's the, that, there's a bunch of them this month. So I won't spend too much. Oh, geez, I guess I have more casualties and non-suicide. Okay. And then, of course, and this is just overall attack patterns. And again, it's really kind of hard to see a pattern. You know? And so we'll talk about why that is. I mean... There are breaks and there, you know, there are strong periods for them. Uh, so why is it heating up? Um, well, pressure on the border areas by coalition forces. I've just talked about that a little bit. Uh, increased pressure from Pakistan. A friend of mine in joint planning said that they have really pushed the PAC government to work a little harder, and they have. And that plus they believe the earthquake in that area and a stronger U.S. presence in Pakistan, even if even humanitarian relief, has led to a kind of denial of sort of other, you know, areas of safe haven. So it's, again, probably or possibly pushed, they feel it's pushed the combatants right into the forward operating bases, again, which would mean you're going to draw more contact. Um, seasonal. Um, if you go back to, now this wouldn't apply for suicide attacks, but, I mean, if you go back to the fighting patterns in Afghanistan, and I don't have this graph put together yet, but, and it's one thing I'm going to do next, um, I, you know, because I want to know for sure, but the percent, my percent, my belief is that when the winters come in, because already uh, the guys at the Ford operating bases out in the Pakia province and Lugar and those places, they're seeing less and less activity as the snows get higher and higher. It's just hard to move around. And if you take other combats, uh, conflicts like Chechnya, also in the wintertime, combat activity dies down. It's just pure logistics. You know, you got 10 feet of snow, so the passes, it's just not that hard. It's not that easy to set up an ambush. It's not that easy to drive around and be ambushed. So U.S. patrols go down, uh, enemy activity slows down. Um, the shift to soft targets, 200 trained suicide bombers, maybe, maybe not. What they have definitely felt, or, you know, what the numbers, again, is, well, we could build graphs forever, but the numbers also seem to indicate that there is a shift toward hitting hard targets, U.S. and coalition combat forces. Then you have your ISAF, which is still, I consider, a hard target, but not anywhere near battle ready as the coalition combat forces out on the forward operating bases. And then you have, you know, have the Afghan National Army and then just civilians. And so what they've done, a lot of these um, suicide bombs that are, are, you know, suicide bombing would be an example of hitting soft targets because they're not going after U.S. combat force. They're not going after an up-armored Humvee. You know, they're just not doing it. They're going on, okay, here's an SUV. It's got white people in it, Caucasian people. 
it's driving on the Jalalabad road, we're going to hit this. They don't need, you know, it, they know it's somebody other than Afghans. That would even switch into soft targets because, you know, if you get hit, you're not going to respond. There's not like this battle-ready group that's going to respond. And then the simple fact, and, one, and many people believe that it's just given the uh, insurgencies had time to organize, it's had time to train suicide bombers. I mean, there's been a big deal, again, in Iraq, and I, again, I'm going to bring in Iraq because I think the tactics are somewhat the same, that, you know, there was fear that they have all these man pad, these uh, surface-to-air missiles, and they think that that last helicopter shot down was from a man pad, and they think that they might see a spike, and we'll have to watch for that because they feel like they've been tracking these man pad, these uh, surface-to-air missile schools, training facilities amongst the insurgent groups, and they've graduated a bunch of these guys, and they know for a fact there's at least 2,000 surface-to-air missiles floating around Iraq that they don't have accounted for. We'll see if that plays out into any sort of strategy. We'll also be able to see if the U.S. will stop or change or alter their uh, doctrine for how they operate with helicopters in theater, and the same in Afghanistan. Um, those are just some of that, and they're not all the ideas why. They're not all the ideas, and, and until you get into the head of the insurgency, there's probably no way to know, and that insurgency probably has multiple heads, so again, there's probably no way to know, but these are just some of the factors, I think, which are leading or, I think, responsible for this, this heat up that I think is, it is heating up right now, whether it'll be a long-term strategy or not, I don't know. Um, so the situation report, uh, let's see, what's going on now? <clears throat> The one thing I would notice is, uh, or would say is, it's not up on this, but Army commanders and some of the Ford operating base on the Pakistan border said they've noticed that the insurgency is a lot more organized, that they're hitting U.S. units with 30 to 60 man groups in maneuver type operations, I mean, real technical, tactical stuff. And they believe firmly that they're being trained in that Pakistan by guys that know their business, maybe Pakistan intelligence, maybe Pakistan military, maybe previously trained by the U.S., who knows. But these are actual combat operations on the platoon or two platoon size insurgent groups all along the border. That's an idea of how the insurgency is operating in, in those areas. And the U.S. forces there, like the, the 82nd Airborne, they're, con they're continually making contact. We don't hear a lot about it. There's no reporters out there. They do file, and sometimes when people get killed or this, you know, it, it'll come out. But these things are going on a lot up in that area. Um, <clears throat> So that situation has changed. In the midst of all that, the U.S. plans to reduce its troop strength in Afghanistan this year, but the Brits and the Canadians are going to pick it up. The Canadian, I, I talked to three Canadian soldiers this last week. They're so excited about the new Canadian government because they feel like the last one decimated the military. The up or down side of that is they're going back to Afghanistan. I think there's 1,800 slotted to go back. The light infantry, British British's light infantry is getting ready to go and a few other units. They will take over a good share of what some of the U.S. PRTs, you got to think of Afghanistan as a system of provisional reconstruction teams all around the country, and then these combat ops all around that Pakistan border, two completely different things. Then you've got your sort of ground zero at Bagram, where the uh, force provider, the two-star generals there. And uh, Kabul, the military in Kabul, there's some training, there's bases everywhere, a lot of them are training the ANA. Um, <clears throat> UK, I don't know if you're following this in the press, it's, being, it's, it's become a political argument. Uh, they don't know if they, I mean, I'm not saying they don't know if they want to go, but it's, a, you know, there are a lot of people in the UK that don't want the troops to go. Some of the people in the troop, uh, in the Army and the Defense Ministry are saying that they're not prepared to go for the kind of mission they anticipate. Again, we'll see where they end up. And um, then constantly in the mix of, and then, Basically, it's a shift toward a U.S.-led coalition to a NATO. They want to turn Afghanistan over to NATO. General Jones, the UCOM commanders, made multiple trips out there. As you know, uh, Afghanistan is under the Central Command area of operations. The Central <coughs> Command obviously has a lot of work. It's the Middle East and Central Asia. But they want Afghanistan to be as much of a NATO push as they can. And the UCOM commander for the U.S. wears two hats. He's the NATO commander and the European command, uh, commander. So it's all the initiative. It's, it's definitely a U.S. initiative as well to get NATO allies involved in Afghanistan. However, uh, and I put this up, building up the ANA I think is probably the most uh, important thing because and I'm going to talk about that soon. And that's, that mission will go, you know, whoever's, whoever's working over there. And we're not reducing troops by a lot. I think we're going to go from 16,000 to 13,000. You know, so, I mean, we're not reducing a lot. There's not a lot of troops there compared to Iraq, but it's, it's enough. I don't know if it's enough, but there's a little option. Um, <clears throat> I put read between the lines because one of the things that sort of plagued me 
and I get it when I go and we talk to the different units, is you have a mission to separate the insurgents from the population, to win hearts and minds, to nation build, reconstruction. At the same time, you operate under force protection guidelines. And you hear people in the, me in the media, and you hear the media say, you know, Fortress America. And you hear journalists come back and say, well, the U.S. soldier doesn't know what's going on because he lives behind the wire all the time. That is true. Because they are, in my opinion, there's a fundamental disparity between force protection guidelines and sometimes what the mission requires. Let me give you, I don't, I'm, let me give you an example. <clears throat> if you're a battalion commander, company commander, brigade commander, you obviously have two missions. One is whatever it is at the time you go, if it's reconstruct or if you're in Bakuba or you're in uh, Fort Operating Base, uh, you know, somewhere on the PAC border, you may have whatever your combat mission is. But you also have your mission, no one's left behind, you bring as many, you bring everybody home. Nobody wants to lose a lot of people. The, um, so you can't, it's hard to just go and sort of drive around and wander around Afghanistan. And so what happens is you come in these armored, hum these armored columns and they kind of, this, this is an armored Humvee here, up armored Humvee. In fact, I'll tell you a story about that and you can't really see it. That's a sniper round that hit when we were in Kandahar. Um, but these guys are a mix of different, from different units. They're not dressed like regular soldiers, so they kind of, you can guess they come from different places. This guy is probably on loan from a different unit because he brought his saw gun with it, saw, you know, a saw with him. And they ride in two, three, four vehicle convoys minimum and uh, to get from A to B. Everybody else is at a base. There are 12,000 soldiers at Bagram. Most of them will never leave the base their entire deployment in Afghanistan, which isn't bad. Just saying, if you're, what's the mission? It's sometimes hard to carry your mission if you never leave the base. It gets even more interesting when you put in all the other agencies. Um, there's, I think, 16 PRTs right now, provisional reconstruction teams. I'm talking about, I'm just going to fuse this into the State Department and DOD relationship. I hate to make too much of this kind of a cliche, but it's totally, in my opinion, strained on the ground. One, there's over half of the, all the PRTs are supposed to have a battalion commander and a, a civilian state, a State Department employee side by, side by side. So they lead the PRT, a military side, a state side. State has only been able to fill half the PRTs. Why? Because when they get to the level of pay grade they need, and this, I talked to a State Department guy last month, he said, they would rather resign than go to Afghanistan. Because when they get to that pay grade and they're in their mid-40s or early 40s and they got kids at home or kids going to college, they're like, I'm not going to do it. So they can't be ordered to go there. When you're in the Army and you're a lieutenant commander, lieutenant colonel, you're going to Afghanistan. Okay, you're going to Afghanistan. That's just the way it is. It's a different sort of mentality. It's a different mandate. It's, it's not bad. It's just the way it is. They can't fill. So there is no State Department representative. There is no civilian personnel in these PRTs, which means all the reconstruction work and all the combat work and all the security work is done by U.S. forces. The U.S. forces, I think, are great, but they're designed to kill stuff, blow stuff up. I mean, that is their primary mission. We give them three or four days of lecture as to how to prepare mentally and how to see the people, and then they go to three months to learn how to throw grenades and fire weapons downrange. Chances are no one will, fire, will throw a grenade in the whole deployment, but they still do that because that's what war fighters do. It's one of the, it's just one of those things. I'm like I say, I can't make a judgment call whether it's good or bad because it's a force protection guideline. It's, I mean, there's, those force protection rules are there. Uh, I had a DVD clip. Could we show the DVD clip? And it's just my ride from, let's see if we can pull it up seamlessly. We should get a screen that allows us to. Uh, I wonder if it's Is that DVD to do? I wonder if it got put in there. If there's any question or comments for our sorting this out, you can. It's plain, but it's not plain here? Okay. Well, maybe we won't show the DVD. But basically, it's a helicopter. It's my ride from Bagram to Kabul. It's a couple hour drive by car because the road's not great. It's a 20, 30 minute helicopter ride. And I put it in there, and we cut it down to about seven minutes. And in a way, it's beautiful because of the barren landscape, but in a way, it's kind of tedious because I wanted to show that that's the view that everybody, that's the view that U.S. soldiers are getting on the ground there. 
you either in a heli helicopter. My next video was a, was a slide was a was a video of us going from Kandahar to Kabul. It's a 10 hour, eight to 10 hour drive. It used to be a two day drive, but they're putting the ring road together, and they've really done a good job there. Um, but it's dangerous. Everybody's in an armored con convoy, and that's the drive. And if you stop, you make really good security provisions when you stop. You fan out, you do 360 around the vehicles or whatever. You make sure that you protect your perimeter. Um, I just will say a note about that armored Humvee. When we got to Kandahar, we went to Kandahar, and this is honestly only to see Kandahar, because I wanted to, we wanted to see what was going on. So we took an SUV and a, and a Humvee, and we're going to go pick up another armored Humvee that somebody had a spare, and they were going to... Well, it's kind of like that scavenger. You everybody see the Green Beret? They always have that one Green Beret you can go get any piece of equipment he needs by basically stealing it from anybody else. Well, they had found this one Humvee in somebody else's camp and realized that they could steal this Humvee, and so they were going to take it. And um, so we drove into Kandahar right next to the P – they had a little safe house right next to the Canadian PRT, I would say about 100 yards away. Left the uh, Humvee there because it's kind of a target. Took the other one, the SU – the uh, Forerunner, drove to this place, picked up the other one, drove through – and within like five minutes took a sniper round in the, in the rear passenger window. But it, it didn't break the glass. It just shattered. I mean, just kind of splintered the glass. didn't break it. Got back in the safe house like, man. It's, and kind of joke that, you know, the bullet probably ricocheted, hit somebody else, and now the press will say the U.S. forces shot somebody as they drove through Kandahar. You know, it's, you never know. So the next morning leaving, we were, weren't on the road two minutes, going about 25 miles an hour, trying to get through town, which is, you know, which is, Pretty good speed in Kandahar. Took a sniper around right in the front driver window, like basically dead center. At, at about 25 miles an hour, everybody was really impressed because that was a, it was a good shot. I mean, but we were only on the road five minutes or ten minutes each day in that in that vehicle. And again, like I say, the Channel 4 crew that just returned from Afghanistan were trying to shoot this documentary. They couldn't shoot in Kandahar. Just couldn't do it. It's just getting it's, it's pretty bad. We'll go back to the slides because I'm not sure. Plus, I think I only have till one anyway, right? Um, what? I only have till ten to one. Okay. I guess I better get rolling, huh? I've talked pretty fast, and no one said anything. So, please feel free to interrupt. Oh, okay. I got to get forward and backward. Anyway, so that's the glass, and that's where that one round hit, like right there. Can't really see it. It's so small. But um, that's the actual Humvee. And, you know, when we drove through Kandahar, we uh, took the gun out, buttoned down the hatch, because one thing they love to do is blow up a grenade inside the hatch while you're just going like five miles an hour through civilian traffic. So you don't want to just have the grenade get lobbed in. It's happened a number of times in Iraq, blowing everybody from the inside. And they've tried in Afghanistan, too. So we were totally latched down. There was no attempt at even or thought of getting out and fighting. Again, it was just like you get from point A to point B as quick and as safe as possible, because everything in between is considered, well, you know, it's bad. It's bad. And, uh, you know, obviously everybody had personal weapons, but, you know, you really wouldn't want to be able to try to use them. I mean, you wouldn't want to jump out of the street in Kandahar. So it goes back to, I think I'll start to sum up. The overall strategy is it does appear that it's heating up. But the one thing, and this, and because of this force protection guidelines, the fact that it's hard, you can't just, there are foot patrols, don't get me wrong, and there are helicopter air assault in these combat areas. And the ISAF patrols will sometimes do foot patrols around Kabul in certain areas, but they're small patrols, limited. They don't have a big presence, a big footprint. So what's the overall strategy? And you hear it over and over again by the Joint Chiefs and the, you know, Rumsfeld is they, we want to try to build the National Army, the Afghan National Army. These people have to have their own security elements in place. But um, it's interesting. A good friend of mine is a trainer, and he's training, well, and I talked to lots of uh, trainers, embed trainers, U.S. like retired lieutenant colonels, and basically he's got a team up in the north, and they're working with three special forces ODAs, three special forces uh, um, tactical teams, his team, and a bunch of reservists from Florida, and they put together this train operator, and they're training um, these Afghan militias. And one, the hardest thing is they've got to break the Soviet model. And what I want to basically talk about is you inherited, in Afghanistan, you became a warlord or a military leader, I should say, because you were basically a warlord or Soviet trained, but more likely you were a warlord because the Mujahideen in the end won, right? So you regained like Dostum and Mohakik and Osted Atta and Ishmael Khan. You regained or you gained uh, power over your area, charisma, you know, sheer numbers, luck, 
um, unholy alliances with everybody just to get, you know, whatever it took. Were, were they good disciplined military generals? I mean, the idea of a general. I would say none of the warlords in Afghanistan I've met. I mean, I've heard good things about Bismil Khan. I've never met him. I wouldn't say that they're generals like in the modern sense. They don't know how to run an organized armed force. They don't, you know. And so the biggest problem is, you know, if you look at the way the armies are, it's, it's your NCO, your non-commissioned officers and soldiers that do most of the fighting. They're going to have to do most of this work. The officers should be planning, executing. The Soviet model doesn't raise the importance or the level of the non-commissioned officers to a point where they can actually be any good at anything. And so one of the things they're trying to do is they're running all the sergeants. Some of them have come to master sergeant school in El Paso, Texas. Others have gone different places to Fort, some of the officers have gone to Fort Leavenworth. But the problem is Afghan officers, they have no real respect for the NCO Corps. What they're trying to do is teach the NCOs to be effective. Like when you're in the, you know, I was in Operation Iraqi Freedom, you have a lieutenant who's your platoon commander, and then you have a first sergeant, where well, the first sergeant was your equivalent to the lieutenant but from the enlisted ranks, and he had more day-to-day -day work with the soldiers. So he had like a, an enlisted and an officer rank guy right along the top of the leadership of that platoon, and there's lots of reasons for that. Now, here's what's really been kind of interesting, is that the NCO, because they're younger, they're more malleable, they've gotten good really fast, and the officers were these old inherited warlords they have gotten worse because they're bucking the system. They don't want to become good proficient officers. They like the corruption and the payoffs, and they think of rank as a privilege. It's like, I'm the general, I'm the warlord, what do I get? Rather than I'm the general, what are my responsibilities? Talk to brigade commander in the U.S. or the U.K. or the Canadian Armed Forces, the German, and they're like, oh, man, I've got 4,000 troops I've got to take care of. I don't want, to take, I don't want any casualties. I've got to do everything I can to make sure everybody's doing what they should, to carry out mission, do this. The flip side of this army is that well, I'm a brigade commander, so I need a house and two cell phones and a car, and, you know, I need this. And that, that's, that's kind of like their, um, what they care about first. So trying to break that. But what I found most uh, intriguing about this or most was this NCO issue. They've trained NCOs that they're actually better soldiers than the warlords of the, these inherited generals of the Afghan army. And almost all the U.S. trainers said the same thing. I didn't hear anyone say anything different, actually, is that we have fantastic NCOs coming up. But the generals don't understand that they have to work with this guy, and he has to be in charge of this, and he has to have the mutual respect. If you go to the division command, the force provider in Afghanistan for the U.S. forces, the two-star, General Kamiya, uh, Command Sergeant Major Savusa, his office is right next to the generals. They're the same size office, and he answers to no one except the general. Colonels can walk in off the street and order him around, and he can say, sorry. You know, I order you around because I am the division general. I'm the force provider's command sergeant major. And so this ranking NCO class that goes up and helps sort out all the enlistment issues is not developing well in the Afghan army. And everybody said it's a major problem. The other thing is if you look at the sergeant major, Savusa has been in the army over 25 years. He's got a bachelor's degree, tons of experience. The average sergeant major, or the average command sergeant in the new Afga the Afghan army right now is 22 to 26 years old. That is way too, I mean, they just don't have the experience yet. There's another reason why they're kind of butting heads against warlords who are in their 40s or 50s who have been fighting the Soviets and the Taliban and who knows who for so long we feel they've inherited this position, it's mine, I take this, and I'm not going to listen to a 26-year-old. There's no way. So that's a major problem. It doesn't mean that it won't work. It just means that this, uh, this um, urgency to get the A and A running and to get in Iraq, the new Iraqi army, we're kind of facing similar things. Um, I won't speak any more about Iraq, but so so conclusion. This is the I think the Canadians' vehicle. See the steering wheel? Is that the steering wheel? And R16. Pretty bad. Um, is it heating up in Afghanistan? It has been the last few months. Is that a long term? Is it a, a trend that's going to continue? It's hard to say. I think it'll be seasonal. I think what you will find is attacks against uh, insurgent type armed attacks may slow down in the winter months because you're just not going to fight along the Pakistan border too much during the heavy snow season. However, it shouldn't or wouldn't stop suicide attacks from the cities because Kabul and Kandahar, they're in very temperate climates, relatively speaking and you might see an increase. The other thing is you've seen there's been suicide attacks, and I didn't have time to build a map. They're all over the place, even as far west as Herat, down on the uh, Iranian side of Afghanistan. 
there's been suicide attacks there. So it's not com just limited to Kandahar or the Jalalabad Road. Coincidentally, what's funny to me about the Jalalabad Road, and I just heard this, I looked for written proof, I couldn't find it, but the, um, one of the big shifts with the ANA is they want to, you know, again, take care of their own security. Well, up until just about last month, or two months ago, President Karzai's detail was run by U.S. First, it was Special Forces protected President Karzai always, and it became a Dynacorp. It was a contracted out to Dynacorp. The Dynacorp guys were there while I was there, and they were basically at the same time turning it over to Afghan. So now President Karzai is completely, his security is all Afghan. Um, the Jalalabad Road, which is really funny because it's the critical road, which most of the IDs are there, but it's also the critical road in Kabul because if you go down the Jalalabad Road, you have like Camp Phoenix and another big camp and a special forces base and the turnoff to the only road to go to Bagram. I mean, it's the only road to go to Bagram. And yet that has been recently turned over, I mean, I think six months ago. And again, I just heard this at, in amongst different U.S. forces, but I haven't seen it in print. I, so I... I hate to speak of it as absolute truth, but they said they don't pull security on the Jalalabad Road anymore. That's been turned over to the Afghan forces. They want to do it. There's been a lot of IEDs on that road. One, there's three U.S. camps and the, and the turnoff there. General Kamiya, when he's not flying a helicopter, comes in three armored uh, uh, suburbans. You know, there's 20 soldiers around him because he's, he's the you know, force provider there. He's the, the, the highest ranking of uh, U.S. military person there. He drives that road. A lot of U.S. personnel drive that road. It's the only way to get into town from there. So, um, oh, hey, we have slides. It's quarter till. I know people got to go. I will open it up to questions or comments. Uh, if you want to see one of these, the helicopter ride seven minutes. It's not super impressive. It's just a kind of a view that a lot of soldiers get, which I thought was valuable. Would you guys want to watch that? Or Okay. Can we do the vlog? There's no narration. It's just...
Um, I know we need to close. Uh, I, I kind of wanted that to be long enough to be tedious because I wanted you to get an idea of like, that's kind of what it is. You drive from point or you fly from point A to point B in most cases. Uh, if you'll notice at the very end, there was a, pat, a helicopter peeling off. That was the Apache Escort. So even then we had two Black Hawks and Apache Escort. Apache gunship, 20 minute ride. You know, I mean, it's again, force protection. Um, I know we need to go again. I, my overall assessment is it heating up? It is right now. Will it be a long-term trend? I don't know. You might see a heat up and more hitting of softer targets like suicide bombs, those kind of things, vehicle-borne IEDs, IEDs, and you might see a, a maybe it actually go down in some of the combat areas. Um, and that's kind of my assessment, which is a great non-answer, right? I didn't answer the question, so. I know you got to go. If there's any questions, be happy or comments. And uh, thank you very much for attending today. Thanks.